Thank you all so much for coming tonight. My name is Paula Kurzmark. I'm the Executive Director of the Denver Health Foundation. We are delighted to have all of you here tonight, and um, in particular, our guest. But first, I'd like to make a few introductions. First, I'd like to talk about the Ann Logan Lectureship in Early Childhood Development. You know, every community has its unsung heroes. And one of ours is Ann Logan. Denver Health was so touched um, by everything that she did for us that we decided that the unsung had to be sung in the case of Ann Logan. The remarkable Ann Logan, the community volunteer, the person who um, for many years served as a children's librarian at the Denver Public Library, and who then, um, in a volunteer capacity, working with her partner in crime at Denver Health, Dr. Steve Bogler, started Reach Out and Read at Denver Health. Starting with about eight of our clinics and putting that program in those clinics and building from there. And it was because of the energy and commitment of this person who had done so much for Denver Public Library in the way of outreach, came into this setting committed to the relationship between early childhood literacy and success in life. And Ann Logan, as a volunteer, has dedicated herself, really, to this work and has made a tremendous difference. Her contributions and the gifts that she has given of her time and energy and talent caused us to say, this unsung hero deserves a song. And so today we have the Ann Logan Lectureship in Early Childhood Development. So Ann, if you would just stand for a moment. So, no fanfare, Anne. <laughs> You've been wonderful, and we love you, and we appreciate everything that you do every day um, for our kids, Colorado's kids. She went on from here, along with her compatriot, Dr. Vogler, um, and started Colorado Reach Out and Read. I think that they now serve something like 80, 80, somewhere between 80 and 90,000 children in the state of Colorado with this really important program. And so it really shows you a little bit about the power of one, what one strong, committed, amazing person can do in a community. So thank you, Ann Logan. Um, there is a steering committee that works with Ann and with Steve Vogler um, to work on this lectureship every year. And I'd like to acknowledge their contribution to this effort as well. Jennifer Stedron, if, if you all would just stand, um, if you would, until we're all done and we'll acknowledge you all together. Jennifer Stedron, Jody Harden, Ginger Maloney, Dr. Simon Hambidge, Dr. Steve Vogler, and Ann Logan. These are the people that make it happen, and thank you very much. We appreciate it. fail to mention the wonderful Candace Jones, who is the events manager at the Denver Health Foundation, does a terrific job and works with this committee to make sure that all the logistics of the event work. You should know that tonight we're also conducting a webinar, and we want to thank the Civic Canopy for serving as hosts for this. Thank you so much. And I want to also note that there is a change in the panel. Sarah Watamura, the DU psychologist and researcher, 
was in an automobile accident and is therefore unable to be here tonight. But we are fortunate to have the panel that we do and look forward to your participation. And um, we'll have Sarah another time, I hope. Okay. Now to the main event. Dr. Deepesh Navsarya, we are so honored that you came to Colorado to be part of this event. We are delighted to have you. And I'd like to just take a moment or two and talk a little bit about you before you start your lecture. I wish that I knew you as well as I knew Ann Logan. Um, but um, just from meeting you briefly, I could see that you have the warmth and kindness that one would hope for in a pediatrician and expect. And um, so we're delighted to have you. Um, Dr. Nasaria is a public health trained pediatrician and a children's librarian. Um, he has a very unique perspective on early childhood literacy and its relationship to toxic stress, and that's what we're going to hear about tonight. He's an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin, the School of Medicine and Public Health, and he practices general pediatrics at the Access Community Health Center. He is also the director of advocacy training for the university's pediatric residency program. He's received national recognition for his accomplishments in pediatric advocacy as an awardee from the Institute on Medicine as a Profession. He's the founder and director of the Pediatric Early Literacy Projects at the University of Wisconsin. And he's also the founding medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin. He's served on a small select working group of the American Academy of Pediatrics, promoting a new strategic priority on early brain and child development. He, you would think with all of that, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 85, 86. <laughs> As we can see he's younger than that, so it makes it all the more amazing. One of the things that I found particularly intriguing um, about Dr. Narsaria um, was the list of all the degrees that he held. Um, so we've just heard the list of all the things that he's done and has accomplished and the jobs that he holds and so forth, the contributions that he's made, but there's so much more. He's a physician's assistant. He is an MD. He is a children's librarian. And he has a master's in public health. Um, it is impressive. Um, and as I said in the beginning, we are very honored to have you here. I'm not going to take up another minute. Let's get started. Dr. Navsaria, welcome to Denver. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind and uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll start by answering the question that usually people are wondering at this point. Yes, I have a lot of student loan debt. So. <laughs> So again, thank you so much to, to Denver Health, to uh, Steve Vogler, to everyone involved in this uh, for uh, inviting me out here. It's uh, really a delight, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing the information that I have for you tonight, and hopefully it helps you take away uh, some nuggets of information, some perspectives that you can use in the really important work that you all do together to serve children, uh, wherever they may be. Now we'll start off with the standard disclosure slide. I have no relevant financial relationship to disclose. I will not discuss any off-label use or investigational use in my presentation. <laughs> so on. Um, although I, the one thing I should disclose is that you know you have to be careful if you hang around me too much. These are my kids um, uh, after they did a little kids race, and uh, if you hang around me for too long, you start to look like this. So, so there you go. I threatened. I told them I was going to use these photos if they acted like that in talks, and they didn't believe me. So. so. Uh, when, I, when I tell folks that one of the things I do with, with my professional career is to encourage families to read books together, to share experiences together, to really try to build those early years of life, you know, often the, the, the response you get is this, aw, that's so nice. And you say, well, yes, it, it is nice, 
but we want to move beyond the idea that sharing books, that talking to each other, that all of these things is just something that's nice. And that really, when we do that, when we talk to families about this and set up policies and programs that really encourage that, that really what we're doing for them is absolutely critical. And that's the, what I want to try to bring out today is some of these ideas and concepts that will let you make that case and that argument for the work you do for the, and, and for the families you serve. However, you can't have a children's librarian come give a talk without having some story time. <laughs> and I do have this book in paper form, but I forgot, so it's on my iPad. So um, This is The Dot by P Peter H. Reynolds, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you the first half of the story, but don't worry, we'll, we'll finish it before the night's through. <clears throat> Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There. Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Hmm. She pushed the paper towards Vashti and quietly said, Now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment, Well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week, when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot she had drawn, her dot, all framed in swirly gold. And I will pause there, and we'll come back to that story mm -hmm. later. <laughs> That's how I make sure you don't leave, really. <laughs> so we'll talk through a few things tonight. We'll talk a bit about the science of early brain and child development, the result of what happens when things don't go right, talk about some possible approaches and solutions, and then finally kind of end with, with the call, the call to action, so to speak. So let's start by talking about the science that's out there. The science really is not new. It's, it's been around and has been evolving over the last 40 years, but what is new is in the last five years we've started to pull together some of these ideas and concepts and notions into what does this really mean? Not just an isolated research finding, but how do we actually apply this to programs, to policies, and ultimately to our patients? What do we tell the patient that's in front of us? The American Academy of Pediatrics has an agenda for children. They revise every year, and these middle, middle areas, these boxes here, are the strategic priorities that the Academy has this year. This one's from a couple of years ago, and you can see right in the middle is early brain and child development. We are in the third of three years now at the Academy trying to synthesize this, and I work with a great group of people on the leadership group trying to really integrate into the um, activities of the academy and to really get the information not just within the academy but out to the rest of the world about early brain and child development. Our motto that we developed, because you gotta have something you can put on a coffee mug, right, is uh, building brains, forging futures, and then our subhead is it's all about nurturing relationships. And actually that subhead I think is probably more important because the relationships is what really makes a big difference. There's an urgency to this. Kids are being failed by our society. There are too many kids that are not succeeding in school, they're not succeeding in life, and they are ending up in all sorts of trouble as a result. We can't wait for another 10 years of data, 20 years of data. We need to move on this now. The other part of this is the essential role of health. We need to make sure that we construe health broadly enough so that we say that this is part of what we do in healthcare whether it's mental health, whether it's primary care, whether it's anything else, we need to make sure that we're viewing this all broadly as a health issue, because it is a health issue. The leadership working group, some, again, some wonderful folks that I work with, um, and some great staff at the academy that really make, keep us in line and, and make everything go. So in 2007, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child released a report called The Science of Early Childhood Development. And what they did is they tried to take all of these ideas and concepts and research and pull it together into several key points that we could then apply to, again, almost any aspect of what we do. And I want to share those with you because I think they are so important and so well thought out. First of all, child development is a foundation for community and economic development. 
This is, I hope, obvious to almost everyone in the room, but we need to make sure everyone hears that loud and clear. Children are literally the future for society. They are our future citizens. They are our future workforce. We need to invest in them as such. Number two, brains are built over time. There's often this notion that if you just intervene at the right time, you'll fix everything. Okay, so reading. Where do we like to intervene with reading? Third grade. Why third grade? Because we measure it in the fourth grade. Okay, well, okay that's nice if you're going for cheap short-term gain, but what about the eight years of the child's life that preceded third grade? You can't just ignore that. Likewise, short-term issues doesn't mean necessarily a lifetime of things not working out right. Brains really are built over time. We need to think about all the way to 18, 21, whatever, and through and into and through adulthood as well. Because it's not just the biology that matters that we always think about so much in healthcare. It's health and development and more and more the ecology. What is the social and physical environment that children live in? That is just as important as the other two. And if you're going to predict how kids do over time, there's kind of a three-legged stool that we set up here. Again, the biological factors that we think about. The socioeconomic environment, we've known for a long time about the social determinants of health and what matters there. But the third part of the stool is the immediate environment children are in. What are the attachment and relationship patterns right around them, at home, in their early childhood center, wherever it may be? Those matter just as much as the other two factors. Because that brings us to the next point, which is that there's two things that shape the physical architecture of the brain as it develops. Genes and experience. I think of it as a campfire. You need to have the wood, you need to have the spark to get the campfire. Same thing, you need the two together. It's not just all genetics, it's not just all experience. And the active ingredient, what is it that decides how that brain is shaped, is the nature of children's engagement in relationships with others around them. Relationships with people. People, not products, okay? So the educational DVD, uh-uh. No evidence for it, probably harmful actually. The interactive iPad game, young children, uh-uh, no good. They need to be talking to and interacting with people, and that is much more important than anything else. Because again, as I said, it comes down to relationships. Because human beings develop through affiliation, through relationships. They have that need, and that's how development moves forward. When I was an undergrad um, in Boston, I worked at the Child Development Unit at Children's Hospital in Boston for a while. And the head there, Ed Tronic, delivered, uh, developed a paradigm called the face-to-face -face paradigm, which some of you may have heard of. And um, I'll, I think this video, which he'll explain the paradigm in, really highlights the importance of relationships, even on a short-term basis, of what those supportive relationships can or can't provide. I'll let Dr. Tronic explain. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I you like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress 
that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good there's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So the hard part, I, I, I used to code these videotapes um, as an undergrad, and the hard part was not seeing interactions like that. The hard part was when the mother would go into the still face and the baby wouldn't do anything. So why? Because the child was not used to having face-to-face -face play. So to not have interaction was actually normal. Now, you know, there's a variety of hypotheses as to why and so on, but you know, I think for a lot of families, they feel, what is my child going to learn from me because I failed or struggled in school, I had difficulties out there, my child is better off learning from this educational DVD. It says so right on the back, right? You know, they're, they're not going to learn anything useful from me as a parent. So part of what we need to think about is, how do we get parents that message that we believe in their ability to help their child, that their, their interaction is more key than anything else, uh, and to really make sure that kids aren't being blocked out of interaction one way or another. The next point is that you need basic skills and circuits, the simple things, in order to be the building blocks for more complex stuff. So you need to be able to invest in those simple sounds, simple motor skills, et cetera, in order to be able to do more complicated things. That is important because you, kids need that foundation. This next one we're going to spend a few moments on because it is so important, this idea of toxic stress. And we'll define that more carefully in a moment. But toxic stress has persistent neuroendocrine effects that can affect a child when they experience this toxic stress early in life. It can affect them really all through their life. Permanent changes in their ability to learn, behavior, mental health, and in their physical health. So you don't need to know much about how to read CT scans if I tell you that, hey, these are head CTs of two, three-year-old kids. This is a more typically developing <coughs> child. This is a child who underwent extreme neglect in the first few years of life. This head is much smaller. The brain looks shrunken. It's not as neuronally dense. The ventricles are enlarged. This is in an extreme situation. So you can imagine, even when you can't see it so easily on a scan, in less extreme circumstances, there are microscopic changes that are happening in the brain that we are able to show through some other things, which we'll get to. But it does make a difference to brain development. Now, stress is a part of life. You know, stress is how we respond as living organisms to changes around us. So very simplistically, in the stress response, we release cortisol, we release epinephrine. Now, we think of stress as a bad thing. We say, oh, you know, too stressed out, too much stress, et cetera. Sure. But small amounts of stress are actually how we adapt to things. So there's such a thing as positive stress. It's actually how you learn and, and, and uh, are able to move forward with things. So we can set up a kind of a three-level system here. We have positive stressors. Brief increases in heart rate, stress hormone levels go up a little bit. I joke that this happens every time I give a talk. And, <laughs> and that's a good thing. You don't want me falling asleep up here or forgetting what to say or, or whatever, because you know that's, that's what, you, what you need someone to do. Tolerable stress, on the other hand, is non-normative stress. It's not everyday sorts of stressors, usually. And they're temporary, and they're buffered by good supportive relationships. And then we have toxic stress. Now, let me be very clear. Toxic stress is not a single bad stressor. Toxic stress is the prolonged activation of the stress re response systems. It doesn't have a chance to really let up. Prolonged activation, and you have few or no protective relationships. And that's really the kicker. Because that socio-emotional buffering, or lack thereof, might be the primary factor that distinguishes that level of stress. And in a sense, you can think about toxic stress as being almost a vector, an intergenerational transmitter of disparities. If you can't show your child how to deal with homelessness and food insecurity and all that stuff, it's going to be very hard for them to develop that skill set as well. So in a child's life, 
What are examples of positive stress? Well, here's one that I cause all the time. Someone shows up with their shots, okay? <laughs> and if they're old enough to know what those shots are, they see the shots there, and they go, ah, you know, and that's okay. They are anticipating a painful event. They are having a normal stress response. They get their shots, and they discover it wasn't so bad, even though they'll claim it was, um, and, and tell elaborate stories about how huge the needle was. Um, but pain is over, done, you know. Another one, parent leaves on the first day of preschool. Okay, separation from a familiar caregiver, you know, the child cries, is upset. These are examples of stress, but it's stress that they can then adapt to their environment in. Tolerable stress, again, are things that are less common, but that can affect them. Death of a family member, serious illness, natural disaster. These are all examples of what we hope are tolerable stress because if the situation resolves and they get good buffering support, then long term it can actually be somewhat positive for the child. They learn to be more resilient and develop defense, and defense mechanisms and so on. However, what if it's worse? What if these, these protective relationships just aren't there or they're already frayed by the environment around? Child abuse. Child abuse unfortunately tends not to be a one-time issue. It's often part of a larger pattern of issues. Parental substance abuse, same thing. Homelessness. These are the sorts of things that for children we term toxic stress. Okay, so what actually happens in the brain when they undergo this early adversity? So there's the one slide I have here of the brain. The amygdala I like to think of as the worry ward of the brain. This is what your fight or flight, respond quickly to things, um, don't plan, instinct, fear, anxiety, all those sorts of things. The amygdala is actually enlarged in kids who've undergone early adversity, and we can see that on scans. Now, countering the amygdala are two areas. One is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is usually a check to the amygdala. It's your planning, your higher reasoning, your delayed gratification, all those sorts of things. We actually see less neuronal density in kids who have, uh, have undergone early adversity in their prefrontal cortices, and we see on functional MRI, it just lights up less. It's not as active. And then we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays a major role in memory and mood, and the volumes are significantly smaller in those kids with early adversity. So think about this for a second. You have a kid who's anxious, impulsive, acts without thinking. They don't plan ahead. They can't delay gratification. Their memory's crummy. Their mood's all over the place. Sounds like a lot of the kids, unfortunately, that I see at my practice at a federally qualified health center for school problems, behavior issues, ADHD, those sorts of things. This is not plain old ADHD. They're, they're not going to be magically fixed with just a little bit of medication. There are some kids for whom that works wonderfully, but this is probably what's going on under the hood. Because when I start asking about their past, I discover the family was homeless, often several times. I discover that food's a problem. I discover that the child witnessed domestic violence. All these things together, you see the burden of what that does. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can't fix that so easily. These are the brain changes that are happening. I don't have a way to undo that very easily. Gosh, we should be trying to prevent it. We do a lot of things screening for things like lead, because lead is neurotoxic. I would argue to you that poverty is neurotoxic as well. Two studies I want to share, share with you. The first one is four-year-old kids. They're enrolled in Head Start. They measured their salary cortisol. They did formal testing of their executive functioning. And then they also went ahead and asked their teachers, what is their behavior like in the classroom? And they found a few different cortisol patterns. This blue line here is a typical pattern. Stressor happens, cortisol goes up. Stressor goes away, cortisol goes down. Those kids with a typical cortisol response had higher executive functioning on testing and were rated as having more self-control in the classroom. Okay? Those with any other kind of response, a blunted response, high, low, anything like that, some sort of abnormal cortisol response, had low levels of executive functioning, and their teachers said they had more difficulty regulating themselves. So there's some sort of connection between the stress response system and what's happening with cognitive capabilities as well as behavioral capabilities. Some sort of connection happening there. So that's one study. Let's go to the second study here. This is an unrelated study where they looked at 1,200 kids. And they watched them play with their moms. And they said, oh, those moms who did scaffolding play, and I'll define that in a moment, those babies had lower cortisol levels and paid more attention to what was going on. Scaffolding play is when the mother will set things up, kind of facilitate the play, but they won't do things for the child. 
So for example, they'll take the shape sorter and they'll say, look, it's a circle. Put it in the circle and the baby goes, oh, huh, and takes the triangle and tries promptly to put it through the square. And of course it doesn't go. So in scaffolding play, mom just kind of holds back, lets baby explore, maybe they try another hole, maybe they try another shape, maybe they try orienting it differently. They try all these different things. In a more authoritarian play style, same thing happens. Baby goes for it, goes to the wrong hole, and what does mom do? She says, no, 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 that's not right, and guides their arm to the right answer. Now, the shape sorter is not about the right answer, okay? Mm -hmm. It's, 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 you know, no one's hopefully doing your college admissions based on your shape sorter performance when you do <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. The shape sorter is about hypothesis testing. It's about fine motor skills. It's about spatial relations. It's about persistence. It's about curiosity. It's about all those things. But it's not about the right answer. So the moms who did more authoritarian play styles, the babies had higher levels of cortisol and were paid less attention. So, there's something going on there. How young did they see this? seven months of age. And it held up through the study period, which took it through to 15 months of age. And the final kicker was the more impoverished the family, the less likely they were to engage in scaffolding. So the observation I shared with you earlier about families living in poverty having different interaction styles with their children, we're seeing it play out in terms of the biology of the child, and then we see the implications. And yes, there's a lot of connections and leaps there, but we've known that when children don't get good connecting relationships, we see the effect in what happens in school. And now we finally have biology to connect that and say, what's, how do we get from here to there? That, what were all the, the leaps that happened? So we know that early death happens because of a variety of disease and dis disability and so on. And health risk <coughs> behaviors lead to that. But there's some level of impairment that leads to those risky behaviors. And there's probably something about adversity underneath. How many of you are familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? So good, excellent. This is a, a much higher percentage, as I expected, than most audiences where I usually just get like two or three hands, um, which is why for those audiences, I usually call it the most important study you've probably never heard of. <laughs> I threw the probably in. Um, briefly, in the 80s, uh, Dr. Filetti was doing obesity treatment programs, and he, he discovered that people who were successful in losing weight were dropping out, saying, I'm not spit out. I'm not uh, cut out for this. I can't do this. I want out. I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. And he discovered many of those folks who were dropping out had histories of childhood abuse or trauma. He said, okay, there's something going on here. I'm working with adults. This is way in their past. Why are we seeing this? <clears throat> Worked with the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. They looked at 17,000 patients retrospectively. First time anyone simultaneously assessed these different types of abuse and household dysfunction and all sorts of things. The thing that often gets lost is who the participants were. Everyone assumes that this must be people living in poverty, and they're not. They are actually upper middle class folks, mostly Caucasian, overwhelmingly college educated, in their 50s, split between men and women. This is not an impoverished, at risk population. This is actually far from that, which is why the findings are so amazing. So they looked at various different categories of um, dysfunction, different types of abuse, neglect, Domestic violence against the mother, household substance abuse, mental illness, parental separation or divorce, incarcerated household member. These numbers in the parentheses are the prevalence in that group. 26% of them said that they were physically abused as a child. And again, this wasn't A, were you physically abused, check yes, check no. They asked more detailed questions and then kind of grouped them into categories. Even the lowest number on there, 6% for incarcerated household member. That's in a busy internal medicine practice, that's one patient every day that has this lurking in their background. So this is not inconsequential. So if you give one point for each of these things, you get what we call an ACE score. So a third of them had no adverse childhood experiences, but a quarter had at least one. And look at this, four, five, or six. You had one in 20 for each of those categories. These were unexpectedly common. And then when you started looking carefully at what the long-term effects were, they found the effects were cumulative. So what does that mean? First of all, as a child, did they have developmental delay in those first three years of life? Well, if you had five, six, or seven risk factors, you're talking about a virtual guarantee that you had developmental delay. So we know there's a near-term issue in terms of adversity negatively affecting development. Does it matter long-term? This slide is stunning. The risks for adult heart disease go up to three times when you have seven or eight adverse experiences 
versus none. Three times, early adversity is baking into the biology of young children changes that are playing out in their physical health 50 years later. And this holds up not just for heart disease, but for all sorts of other things. It holds up for smoking and COPD risks, adult alcoholism, depression, suicide attempts, IV drug use, and, and the list goes on. And, and we have seen over and over and over that when they've looked at other data, they've looked at it by state, we've seen that when you look again, these ACEs data all hold up. We're seeing this over and over. This is not even a question that these things make a difference. I want to take a few moments to talk a bit about the, the science of epigenetics. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about it and what does it mean and, and so on. And it can be a little complicated, so that's why I say it's, it's really cool stuff, but I don't completely understand it either. <laughs> um, but I think there's some big principles that you can take away from it. Um, one of the most interesting things about epigenetics was, you know, so if, if you remember back to biology, we, we talked about how um, Lamarck used to think that giraffes got long necks because they stretch to reach higher leaves, and because they stretch, that somehow changed their genetics, so they passed that on to their offspring and so on. And then we said, oh, that was nonsense. It was simply natural selection. Darwin came in and, you know, and so on, and that Lamarck, how could you ever think such a thing? And he, he went down in the history books as a laughing stock. Well, you know, those, those giraffes, you know, certainly don't pass on longer necks to their offspring just by stretching and looking for leaves, but to a certain extent, a small extent, maybe Lamarck was actually right. Because with epigenetics, we're discovering that the central dogma that we had, that you do, you have DNA, and that gets transcribed to RNA, and that makes proteins, which have all the effects they do. And we used to think you couldn't go back and really modify DNA all that much, except in the next generation through reproduction. We're discovering that, well, actually, maybe you can modify DNA, or at least modify how it's expressed. And that's what the science of epigenetics uh, is saying. So our structural genome has about 23,000 <coughs> inherited genes. This is what we usually have always thought of about as, as a genome. The epigenome is however built over time. It's built over your lifetime. And it determines what genes are expressed because of the surroundings and experiences around them. So the structural genome is to the epigenome, if you want to take a quick excursion into the world of computers, as hardware is to an operating system. Okay? The structural genome shouldn't change. The epigenome, on the other hand, can change and modify over time on, on a slower, not an immediate thing. And so you could have twins. Identical twins have the same genome, the same structural genome, but they could have different epigenomes if they have different experiences. So it's like, okay, that makes sense that, you know, that it's something that modifies over time. So what are the switches? What is it that makes a difference? It's nutritional status, it's toxin exposures, it's environmental interactions, you know, all those sorts of things. And even fetal exposures can lead to epigenetic changes that can, in theory, be passed on to future generations. So we're seeing that there's a lot going on there with environmental uh, issues. When you have repetitive, highly stressful experiences, you, it damages the adversity response systems in young kids. They're just not able to work with that, to be able to work to develop those adversity response systems because the, the adversity is so overwhelming and so crushing. But when you have positive experiences and good learning and supportive relationships and all that, in a sense, it activates that genetic potential that's already there for countering adversity. So it's not just that adversity makes things hard. Adversity also seems to turn off some of the defense mechanisms we have because it is so overwhelming. This slide here shows you just briefly what happens uh, in a sense, or what can happen, because there's not just one master epigenetic mechanism, there's, there's many of them. So you have your external experiences, stress, nutrition, toxins, sets off neuron signaling, blah, 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 it, and it kicks off these gene regulatory proteins inside the cell. And what do they do? They attract or repel these enzymes that add or remove these markers. These epigenetic markers go onto the DNA. They stick on and either turn genes on or off. And that turning on and off is what's happening over time. And we, again, there's biological evidence for this. So what does this mean? It means that early prenatal or postnatal experiences both can influence long-term outcomes by chemically altering genes, whether they're expressed or not. And the brain is very sensitive 
very sensitive to these experiences and environments in early development. So really, the early development matters so much because it makes such a difference there. And we can find that even though the epigenome has been modified, you might still be able to change it back. So that's not, you know, let's not give up on the teenagers. Let's not give up on the adults, okay? Let's not give up on those older kids. It's not, you know, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking, if you don't fix it by age three, we're finished. It's a lot easier to fix it by age three. But we can still make a change. It's just harder. But we can do it. We can restore functioning. So toxic stress shows that we have an urgent need because of these epigenetic changes to try to alleviate this, this adversity that's out there. And remembering that poor decisions we make in our society about how to deal with some of these issues can actually create epigenetic changes that go down through the generations. So that old saw, you know, the Native American saying about think about the next seven generations, you know? It's actually a genetic, a molecular argument for exactly why that might be very, very true, that we may be affecting multiple generations with, what, with the policy decisions we make now. So where are these science policy gaps? Where can we make a difference here? The child welfare system. Again, how are we thinking about how children are placed in foster care, not placed in foster care, about abuse, about staying with their parents, reuniting, all those sorts of things. What are the epigenetic kind of manifestations in thinking about that? What about maternal employment and public assistance? You can say, moms, if you want to get public assistance, you need to go back to work. OK, but how does that increase household stress in terms of the relationships and all those things? In England, in the United Kingdom, when they fought the war on, on child poverty, or when they started fighting the war on child poverty about 10 years ago, they specifically increased maternal leave. They didn't dial it back because of evidence like this. Prenatal and newborn care. What are we doing prenatally? What are we doing with newborns to help reduce the stress on families and the burden on families? Let's not make them do extra because, again, we know that epigenetic changes have the most influence. And, of course, support for new parents. And we'll come back to the parent theme in a few moments. Because if we create the right conditions for early childhood, it's more, it's more effective and less costly than trying to figure it out later on. So, if you look at developmental progress over time, from birth to, say, kindergarten entry, we have the healthy kids, and we want them to stay on that trajectory of developmental progress. We have the ones that are high risk. You know, this is the ex preemie that you can label easily and say, okay, they're at risk for developmental delay. And then you have the at-risk kids. Many more of them, not so easily labeled. The key thing here is that adversity pushes down the development of all these curves. The healthy, typically developing kids are not somehow immune. And the others aren't doing optimally anyway, and it, this gets worse. So what we need to do is have good protective interventions that shield children in the early parts of their life when they are more affected by adversity. So what are those things? It's things that we often do already. Good anticipatory guidance, reading together, good discipline, health services, preschool, all those things. For the at-risk child, we can make sure that those parents know how to be responsive. You can train them to be able to do that face-to-face -face interaction well and to play peekaboo and do all those things with their child. It doesn't take that much. Good language stimulation, again, from people, not products, and high-quality early childhood education. We need to make sure that early childhood education settings are there thinking about what's good for the child and not merely a place to put your child while the parents work. Because that is a lot of people's view of what early childhood is. And it should be about making sure they're getting good stimulation. And then for the highest risk kids, home visiting, specialized services, and all, the, all of the above, of course. Because Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child says there's really three domains where we, can, we really should be focusing. One. What is the emotional and behavioral barriers to learning? I have a lot of patients that are brilliant. And you'd never know it because they have too many behavioral problems and too many emotional issues that are getting in their way of performing well in school. We need to figure that part out so that their true potential can come out. I'm a pediatrician. I think about kids. But you know what? Children live in families. We need to help their parents. We need to transform the lives of the family unit by helping out the parents because they cannot be the good parents that they want to be unless we address their issues as well. And finally, thinking about the health dimension of early childhood policy and practice, that this is really about health, not just about education, not just about child welfare, that this is all globally about health issues. Because the world of pediatrics, and I mean that broadly construed, what do we do when we take care of children, is this, it's a developmental assurance. 
how do we get that child from 0 to 18, 21, whatever endpoint you want to pick, with a healthy brain, healthy mind, healthy body all together. Now, none of this is to say, of course, that children need to be engaged constantly. You know, letting them play on their own is fine, it's a good thing. Bad things are not necessarily a long-term negative, as we pointed out. And children should get appropriate discipline. You're not going to cause toxic stress by putting your child in timeout. Okay? In fact, you may cause more toxic stress by not putting them in timeout. So. so five numbers to remember. There are 700 new neural connections happening per second in the developing brain. We want to take advantage of that in late, toddler, late infancy and early toddlerhood. We can measure disparities in vocabulary as early as 18 months of age. So all this talk about the achievement gap, certainly in Wisconsin we have some of the worst achievement gaps between our higher and lower SES populations. The achievement gap does not start in elementary school. It does not start in kindergarten. It starts well before that. This graph from the Risley Heart Study, receptive vocabulary words, age from 10 months to 36 months, three different SES groups. We can see that the richest kids are already pulling away at, before 18 months. And if we can measure it there, you know the changes are happening before then. By 24 months, we are seeing the gap between the middle class kids and the poorest kids. This is where the gap starts early on. Remember that guarantee of developmental delay when they have multiple adverse uh, risk factors. And then of course those three to one odds of heart disease. This has significant implications for what we do in adult medicine and where we spend our health dollars well down the line. For every dollar you put into early childhood, respected economists are telling us we see four to nine dollars back in, in returns, including James Heckman, who's a Nobel laureate um, in economics, and he has said that dollar for dollar, the investment in early childhood is better than any other investment he could find. And long before we had MRIs and all this stuff, Frederick Douglass told us it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So what is the result? What do we end up seeing? That graph from, uh, that I just showed you with the language gap at 18 months is from this study, meaningful differences in the everyday experiences of young American children. By age three, what did they find? They actually went into homes and they recorded what was going on. Very hard to do, which is why it hasn't been replicated so many times. And what did we see by age three? Between the highest and lowest SES uh, groups here, lowest and highest, we saw that there was a difference in terms of vocabulary size. 525 words versus 1,100 words in terms of receptive vocabulary, the ability to understand words. They also measured IQ. It's a big difference in IQ. I mean, we jump up and down when we see an intervention that creates like a seven point difference. Really big difference right here. How many times did someone in the home speak to that child? Okay, this gets to that language stimulation part. 178 times an hour in the youngest kids. That's, that's a lot of talking going on, right? Look at the richest families, nearly 500 times an hour. Big difference in the quantity and volume of language directed there. And then there was also something about the emotional content. 75,000 versus half a million encouragements by age three, and flipped for discouragements, 200,000 versus 80,000. The upshot is that there's a 30 million word gap between higher and lower SES populations by age four. And the result is that a third of kids nationally are failing their kindergarten screenings. They're being flagged with some sort of issue that's going on. And if you're behind in first grade, most don't catch up. 88% are still behind in fourth grade. School does not magically make everything better as much as they'd like to. And this leads to all sorts of problems. If you can't read well, it leads to school failure. And this, this whole host of poverty and dependency just loops around on itself and creates these cycles, these vicious cycles that go through generation after generation. And school intervention is too late. We can't wait for school because we're missing the window where we can make the biggest difference. And it's hard to repair self-esteem and innate curiosity that kids come equipped with if we can't, if we don't intervene early. The Children's Defense Fund in 2007 had this report. And in it, they, this is the one place I could find like documentation of this. They talked to a state senator in Mississippi who used to be their deputy commissioner of corrections. They said they needed to figure out how many prison cells they needed in 10 years. And they said that the folks that did the study, his words, quote, the third factor, the key factor, was the reading and math scores in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, and that the projection proved to, proved to be very accurate. Now, there's no state that I'm aware of at this point that's using elementary school achievement scores to predict prison, prison, bed, use, uh, prison bed needs. But the question shouldn't be, are they? The question should be, could they? 
And the fact is, we know with depressing accuracy, by the end of elementary school, which kids are going to do OK and which are likely to end up entangled in the criminal justice system. In elementary school, I mean, my kids are just at that point now. They're starting middle school, ending elementary school. It's, it's shocking to think that we already know, in a sense, based on a lot of other data, where they might end up. So what can we do about it? You know, what, what, I've told you all these things, what, what can we do? So I, I, I give you the solution now, finally. <laughs> uh, well, don't get too excited. It's actually only a partial solution. So, so what, what are the sorts of things? The things that we can do in our clinic and hospital and home visiting and all those different settings that, that do make a difference. We can broaden support for parents in community settings, making sure that parents feel well supported and are able to devote the time that they need to being good parents. School-based health centers or other types of interventions like home visiting, which make sure that they can get the care that they need without too many barriers in the way. And we can train parents. Again, we can do low-level quick things on responsiveness training, or we can do resilience and positive parenting and all these things. These things exist, and they can be implemented. Outside of the clinical realm, this really broadening this notion, again, of what it means to apply these principles. Good new strategies, community-based mentoring, after-school programs, all those sorts of things make a difference. Intentional skill building, and I'll come back to that in a moment. How do we build the skills of adults to be good parents? And then making sure our judicial and foster care systems understand these principles and working with others that, that are involved in this, in this area is really key and critical for all of us. Because when it comes to treatment, we have treatment options, but they're really hard to put in place. They're really hard to access. Traumatic stress networks and making sure that people are well trained and that we have insurance coverage. One thing we do at my federally qualified health center, Access Community Health Centers in South Madison, is we actually have primary care psychologists. This is something that more and more places are doing. But I can do a warm handoff to a psychologist while my patient's still in the exam room, and the psychologist will come see them in that same room and deal with their, their, their issue, whether it's something minor, like my child, I need some help limit setting, or whether it's something major, like the, my patient is acutely suicidal. And they help me be, they help that, be that liaison to the, the mental health system and so on. They're currently involved with 20% of all medical patients. That, that includes adults as well, not just kids. And their numbers have been surging. Uh, they've been seeing more and more patients as the years have gone by. And then we also have a consulting psychiatry model where when I say, this kid has too many issues, I, I don't know what to do for them next. A consulting psychiatrist will see them on a one-time basis, provide me with detailed recommendations that then I can implement and then they're still available to me to, to reconsult with if I need help or something unexpected happens and so on. So kind of integrating mental health into the medical home, which is probably where it should be in the first place, is really a nice model that works at least for us in, in, in many arenas. Of course, there's Reach Out and Read. You know, Reach Out and Read, I mean, it's just so wonderful and really lets us carry out. I've, I've often said that the, the engine behind Reach Out and Read is early brain and child development. But if you look at early brain and child development, it's Reach Out and Read that gives it wheels. This is how we can implement this in primary care practice. I give these out, prescriptions to read. Uh, I used to give them out in paper form. They now print on my EMR, actually. Um, and I've handed this out, actually, uh, when I've done advocacy at the state and federal levels. And people remember this. And I hope it gives our families uh, and others the notion that, yes, I think this is really that important. And then finally, home visiting is another example of programs that make a critical difference to our families because they get that support they need, they get it in a comfortable environment, and they get it with the intensity of support they need. And it's not just, hi, we're going to support you, and then when the time's up, we, we pull out the props. We're trying to build skills. I'm going to share a video with you that's done by the Harvard Center for the Developing Child that talks about how we build adult capacities, because it's really what we want to do. We want to build their capacity and ability to be good parents. And uh, they do a very good job of contextualizing this um, in the big picture. The social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. 
a strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family, but also extends out to include the adults who are family members in childcare centers and other programs. What children need is for that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pile-up, the cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity. These skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning could take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So how do those skills get built? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. So then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice. But we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? That's a new idea. Buen trabajo. We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce them? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce source of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society, it's critical for a thriving business, it's critical for a successful environment of relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. what we're trying to do, but it put it in such a wonderful, succinct format, and I think also laid out, kind of intentionally saying, this is what we're setting out to do with so many of the programs that, and policies and so on that we do. 
So the call. Again, what are we doing with EBCD? We're trying to promote lifespan health because we see it's early childhood foundations to kindergarten readiness, preventive mental health, mitigating toxic stress to looking at those social determinants of health. In a way, you could think about this as a public health approach. Kids are going to fall. Some kids will fall despite our best efforts. So what do you do? You have a big net. It has big holes, but it'll catch, hopefully, a lot of those kids with those universal primary preventions, good anticipatory guidance, social supports, high quality child care, all that stuff. For those who fall through, you have a smaller net because it's a more expensive net, but, so it's smaller but you have smaller holes. That's your screening, your targeted interventions, like developmental screening, Head Start, home visiting, you know, all those sorts of things. And then you have the smallest net. This is the one that's the most intensive, small because it's expensive, but it's those evidence-based treatments that are there. You won't want everyone falling through to that bottom level because we don't have the capacity to deal with that. But you want to try to think about this as a stage stepwise approach. Um, I'm going to skip this. We've talked about this essentially. There's the different things that can happen in primary care practice as well as in other forms of, uh, of working with children. We have these competencies that we set out at the EBCD group that I think apply not just to healthcare providers but to anyone working with kids that on a basic level, you know, understand these things we've talked about, look for developmental issues and risk, and just at least refer to other places. When you get to a mid-level, start thinking about community economic development and other things. Think about uh, assessments of development, referral and co-management, and then for high-level stuff, have mental health interventions, relationship monitoring, and advocacy coordination and consultation. There's also the school readiness report from the AAP says we should be talking about the five R's of early childhood education. Routines. Help kids know what to expect of us and what we expect of them. Reading together daily rhyming, playing, cuddling, all those sorts of games. Rewards, remember that data about how many kids are hearing encouragements versus discouragements. Make sure that kids are hearing when they do things right because it is so powerful. And then again, the relationships. So one thing we've done in Wisconsin very recently, in November, the, so Wisconsin's had some interesting politics lately. Um, <laughs> our uh, state house, both chambers and our governor's office um, flipped from the Democratic side to the Republican side in 2010. And it's made it more challenging in some ways to get some um, things uh, uh, through the legislature and through the executive branch. So last November, we introduced a joint resolution. Now, it's a joint resolution, so let's not get too excited. That means it has no money attached to it, and it does not have any force of law, but it's at least a statement of something. We had joint resolution 59 introduced. It passed the Wisconsin Senate unanimously. There's not a whole lot that's going through unanimously these days. Um, and then was taken up by the Wisconsin Assembly yesterday and passed there unanimously. One third of, uh, almost a third of the entire assembly actually added their names as co-sponsors at the last minute um, because now it was cool, so you know. Um, so, uh, they, uh, so this joint resolution passed uh, both uh, the Senate and the, um, the assembly. And what does it actually say? Um, there's a long, you know, whereas, blah, 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 but I'll share with you the result clause. Resolved by the Senate, the Assembly concurring, that policy decisions enacted by the Wisconsin State Legislature will acknowledge and take into account the principles of early childhood brain development and will, whenever possible, consider the concepts of toxic stress, early adversity, and buffering relationships, and note the role of early intervention and investment in early childhood years as important strategies to achieve a lasting foundation for a more prosperous and sustainable state through investing in human capital. I might have written some of this. Um, <laughs> It's a first step because now we're going to use this to try to build on a children's caucus and to build on specific asks that we say, hey, you said this, so you know, let's go in there. But at least for once, um, when, when, when it passed the assembly yesterday, I felt like this, winning. <laughs> so. Because again, if you think about the public investment in children by age, the brain's capacity to change, again, is best early on and drops slowly. It's not zero, but it does drop. But where's our spending on program to ch programs to change the brain? Mm -hmm. It gets more and more the older you get. So we need to try to flip that. The business community, some folks get it. Ready Nation, these are business folks who say, we understand this. This is our future workforce. We need children to be growing up with good capacities and capabilities so that we have people who can actually work for us. 
So again, the Early Brain and Childhood in Development Initiative, Building Brains and Forging Futures, it's again, it's about those nurturing relationships. What about the story? What happened in the story? Let's, let's go back to Vashti and her dog, which she found framed up on the wall when she came back in. She looks at it and she says, hmm, I can make a better dog than that. She opened her never before used set of watercolors and set to work. Vashti painted and painted a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. The blue mixed with the yellow. She discovered that she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting lots of little dots in many colors. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. Vashti splashed her colors with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. She even made a dot by not painting a dot, painting around it. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's many dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're a really great artist. I wish I could draw, he said. I bet you can, said Vashti. Me? No, not me. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle. And then she said, please, sign it. <laughs> And I share this with you because this is a story about building capacity. It's about building capabilities. It wasn't about doing Vashti's work for her. It was about taking that innate talent she had and letting her see it and blossom when you showed her that she was capable of doing it. And then she paid it forward. She paid it forward and was able to help someone else and go on. And in a sense, this, this nugget really takes so much of all these concepts and ideas and what we try to do as a community and kind of encapsulates it in, in one little story. I'm going to close with a video that from the Onset Prevention Fund in Chicago. Some of you may have seen this, um, and it, it really tells us a lot about what is going on with children that's not so good, and then what could be when we actually try to make a difference. I'm one of the thousands of you here who's born into poverty every day. That's my mom. She's 17 and never finished high school. She's got some big dreams for me. But she's alone and she's scared. This is my first birthday. That's my grandma. We got some Tanya and her boyfriend Kevin. We all live together. It's cold and crowded. I hope we go soon. I don't like Kevin. He's always yelling. This is my second birthday. We're all at daycare. Strapped in watching TV again. I wish I could just run around. This is my third birthday. My brother William's taking care of me while my mom sleeps. She works the night shift, so we can't turn off the TV. But we get to go to bed whenever we want. This is my fourth birthday. We're sleeping in my aunt's this month. I don't know when my day is coming home, but I'm hungry and I miss home. This is my first year of kindergarten. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm unprepared. Because I didn't get the right start. I'm twice as likely to be in special education. 30% more likely to never go to college. 70% more likely to be arrested for a violent crime. Become a teen parent. Drop out of school. Never hold a job. Spend the rest of my life in poverty. Thank you.
me all the time. She smiles a lot now, and she knows she's not alone anymore. Grandma, Tanya, and Kevin read me a story every night before I go to bed. I go to my school every day, where I get to run and play and see all my new friends. speaker for next year. Yeah. I'll close with this quote. While schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers, all too often preschool gaps set and train a pattern of ever increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. And I always close with this photo of my wife reading to my son. I just caught them in a lovely moment of being lost in a book together. Um, and it's just one of my favorite items there. So, And with that, I will uh, turn it over to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.